Greetings in the name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and welcome to Recovering Christ Ministry series on Reaching Out to a Hurting World. Today we're going to get right into talking about the steps uh, and, and where they came from and what the steps are. They're just a step-by-step -step process on uh, how to go through the healing and uh, spiritual growth. Uh, it's a step-by-step -step, uh, moving from being in control of our own lives, of letting God be in control of our lives. I just want to really talk about where they came from. The, the steps really came from the Bible, of course. They they originate first used in some official way in recovery in the Oxford group, which was a first century Christian fellowship. And uh, there they had five steps. And they, a couple of the guys got involved with it you know, in the early days of AA. And they took those five steps and they cut them up and they dissected them into 12. Bill Wilson was really the personal author of that, you know, hopefully led by the Holy Spirit. And and what he did is he stopped at 12 because there are 12 apostles. And you could have dissected them even further, but, you know, this, the principles you know, remain the same. And, and the five steps, you know, back then were, one, admitting that you got a problem, two, uh, sharing honestly with another, and three, uh, making amends for the harm that is done, and uh, four, uh, going out and helping others, you know, with the same kind of a problem. And the fifth was uh, asking God to help, you know, with those, with those four things. So it's a step-by-step -step process of healing and spiritual growth. You know, we find that the problem isn't really alcohol or drugs or what we consider to be a life-controlling problem. The problem is really that we're approaching life the wrong way, that we're in control of our own lives and carrying out our own plan. So it's uh, learning how to move from being in control and and, and self-centered to God being control and God centered and we're not alone in doing that we can get a sponsor a sponsor is someone in recovery that's gone ahead of us that's worked the steps and has a successful program recovery and is willing to help us uh, along the way it's kind of like dropping into a jungle and a guide coming up and saying hey uh, I know that these these paths, and I can direct you to safety. You want me to guide you to safety, and of course, you know, hopefully we would say yes. And uh, that's kind of like what a sponsor is. And the other thing is that that God is with you. You don't have to do it alone. Joshua one nine says, "Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go." God is with us and we don't have to do it alone. And let's just get right into step one. Step one says that we admit that we're powerless over our dependencies and that our lives have become unmanageable. Uh, it's really the end of denial uh, is, is the beginning of recovery, as we say. And, and the joke is in recovery is denial is not a river in Egypt. Uh, it's admitting that we have a problem. It's coming, coming to that point of brokenness, coming to the end of ourselves where we say we're sick and tired of being sick and tired. We've we've hit bottom. We've had enough pain, and and admitting that we can't handle things is hard for a lot of people. You know, it's it goes against everything that we've been taught. It goes against our pride. Uh, it uh, it's it, it goes against our ego. Uh, but in order to start getting better, we have to take this step and and call out for help and and admit that you know, hey, I can't handle it. My life is unmanageable, and uh, that I'm powerless over my dependencies. And Romans 5, 6 uh, says, You see that at just the right time, when we are still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. We're not able to save ourselves, and we're not able to heal ourselves, and we're not able to change ourselves. But God can and will do for us what we can't do for ourselves. And this step, it forces us to admit, that we can't manage our own lives. And there's a biblical example of that in the Bible. It's in Luke 15, 11 through uh, 31 of the prodigal son where he had asked for his inheritance from his father. He took uh, his portion of that and he went into a faraway city. And he spent his money on riotous living. That had to be you know, one of the first addicts in, in the Bible and first alcoholics because he lost everything that he had. He hit bottom. He ended up eating with the pigs and he was hungry and he was legally long you know, to eat what the pigs had to eat. And he said something like, you know, if I could only return to my father, his, hire, his hired hands, you know, have plenty, has plenty to eat. And he, and he did return to the father. And the father saw him when he, was a, when he was a far way off, when he was a long way off. And he didn't wait for him to come to him. The father ran after him. 
he hugged him, he embraced him, he loved him, and he restored him. And even through a, through a party for him, he restored him to sonship. And the prodigal son thought that maybe he would have to be relegated to a, a hired hand position, but that was not the case. He put, a, he put the royal robe on him and the ring of sonship on his finger. And that's what God does to us. And when we turn toward him, uh, he restores us and he loves us. And we find out that you know that Jesus uh, is faithful to us today. The reason that these steps work is is not because they are invented by some man or some woman by some human being. They work because Jesus Christ is still in the business of healing and transforming lives today. Now let's listen to what some of the other recovery leaders have to say about this step. And today we have with us Glenn Miller. Glenn Miller, that's not the big band leader, actually, but he does uh, sing and play a musical instrument. He is a pastor, the pastor of Solid Rock Ministries. Uh, Glenn has been recovering himself for over 17 years. He's one of, he has one of the largest Christian residential uh, programs in the country with 184 beds, both for both men and women. And they really do recovery right over there. Uh, pastor Glenn is also the president of... Uh, Christian Recovery Network. I've got a chance to work with him over the years in, in the Bay Area here, and I just have the highest regard for him and the way they do recovery. Pastor, we're glad to have you with us today. It's an honor to be here, Richard. Pastor, would you uh, share with us your favorite scripture verse, please? That would have to be John 8, 36. When the Son of God sets you free, you're free indeed, because that's been the experience that I have received in my life. Pastor Glenn, would you share with us on step one, please? That, that is so important to me to understand today that uh, that step uh, brought me to finally a point of understanding that it wasn't everybody else's problem, it was mine. And when I understood that I was powerless in my life uh, over not only alcohol but people, places, and things. Uh, I had the ability then to to start doing something about it and it, it was difficult for me because I was 42 years old when I, when I, when I finally realized that I had a problem. I'd been told for, for years and years and years that, uh, that I had a problem but I never heard it. And uh, at 42 years old, um, quite honestly, with a pistol in my mouth with the hammer cocked, uh, I was introduced to the solution to that powerlessness. And uh, everybody talks about taking the steps. I don't think that I ever took any of the steps. I think the steps took me. Uh, God did for me what I couldn't do for myself. And the first thing was to to show me my wicked ways and uh, show me the mess that I've made out of my life. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the divorces, the abandoned children, the uh, everything that, 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 that everybody else does. Uh, um, I, I was able to get in touch with that. I was able to see it. Uh, and it was, it was probably the most profound experience that I've ever had in my life because as God illuminated my powerlessness uh, he also made himself real for me. Trisha would you share with us on step one please? Thank you. Step one we admitted we were powerless over our separation from God that our life lives had become unmanageable. Um, when I came into um, I actually came into AA 26 years ago and um, I didn't even know my life was unmanageable. I just knew that I couldn't live with the pain I was in anymore. Um, and when I admitted that my life was powerless, well, it was difficult to admit my life was powerless because I didn't feel I had any power. It was just totally out of control. Um, and when I came into AA, um, when I came into AA, I learned that I was truly a controlling person and that God was setting me free from um, the, po the power that I had in such a negative way. 
um, he was leading me into understanding that um, by admitting that I was powerless and that Jesus Christ did have the power and not me, I was able to let it go and give it to him and was able to um, step out from um, trying to manage things I couldn't manage, trying to control people I couldn't control, trying to get into situations that I had no business being in, but I learned to step back and let God do it and to pray and to give it to God and to let go. Step one, uh, we admitted we were powerless over our disease and our life had become unmanageable. Uh, some people say we're powerless over our addiction and our lives have become unmanageable. But what that step means to me is uh, the first time I was able to get honest with who and what I had become uh, as a result of my drinking and drugging and, and, and fornication and, and, and all those things. And then I came to an acceptance that, uh, that it was true that uh, I had been beaten that I was powerless, uh, that my life was unmanageable. But a big part of step one for myself was uh, looking at the powerlessness, uh, I, I really resisted the fact that I had been beaten by an inanimate object, a liquid, a powder, a solid, or a leaf. Uh, I had a trouble with that, but when I backed into that step and I looked at the unmanageability, I had walked away from my, 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 my job, my career. Uh, I was facing six, five-year sentences. Uh, for sales and possession. I was $10,000 in back child support payments and all of the money that I got went to drinking and drugging uh, and I wasn't taking care of my personal responsibilities. Once I looked at the unmanageability and I was doing it against my will, then I get back into the fact that I had been beaten and I was powerless and that took a lot of rigorous honesty and soul searching uh, to, to get to that point. So step one to me, the spiritual principle that I've embraced there is self-honesty and self-acceptance. George, would you share with us on step one, please? Sure, Richard. Um, and I know you want me to be brief, and I'll get right to the point. And I, I'm brief with people who come into uh, our recovery centers, uh, at the two Salvation Armies, and one in St. Pete and one in Denver. I sit down and we'll do a psychosocial evaluation with them. And the question I'll ask, and uh, sometimes these people have been in recovery for 20 years, but and they've been active in AA. And um, I'll ask them a question, and I'll say, uh, do you have a choice about your, your drinking and your drug? And they'll say, oh, of course I have a choice. I say, well, you've been in AA for quite a while, and you've been amongst them with uh, active in AA. You know the AA big book pretty good. I said, you know what it says on page 24? On page 24 in italics on the big book, it says the alcoholic has lost the ability to make correct choices when it comes to alcohol. It's so-called Willpower seems practically non-existent, and he's unable at certain times to bring to his consciousness with sufficient force the memory of the suffering and humiliation of only a week or a month ago. He's without defense against the first drink, Richard, and this is the thing that people don't understand. Our culture is very free will, self will oriented. It's Cartesian in its uh, philosophy. It's existential. And, it's, and even the churches are, have gone the same way into modern thinking that I'm the thinker and I'm the chooser. I'm the captain of my fate and the master of my soul. And thank God for a man having a drug addiction because it brings him to a place where he begins to realize that inside himself he has no power to uh, control his life. In fact, he begins to understand something that he's a, he's a slave of sin. Uh, the big book says, and says so sin, it says that uh, he's in bondage to himself. Uh, he, and he has to get rid of self or it kills him. And so the 12 step process is a process of applying the crucified life message that, that uh, Bob and Bill got from Frank Buckman, who got a real good dose of it. And uh, they got uh, broken and humbled and began to understand this life uh, of Christ centered recovery. Marcia, would you share with us on step one, please? The thing that I um, like the most about uh, step one is the fact that I didn't have a problem admitting that I was powerless. You know, I came in 
um, just so beaten and so tired and my life was so unmanageable that I remember just thinking there has got to be something better to life than doing what I had been doing for the past 12 years. And so I am, I'm really, it, it wasn't hard for me as, a, as if a lot of times I hear people share, you know, it took a long time to come in. When it was my time, I knew it was my time and I came in and just, you know, totally surrendered my life. And I'm so glad that I felt the presence of God during that time because I was truly, you know, without Him for a long time. And what I have um, come to realize is that uh, it was just a total unmanageability time in my life. Um, having to to read, just to start all over again. Um, once you have lost everything, once you have given up most of everything that you ever valued, and it, it goes back as far as even, you know, what you believed in, um, the way you were raised, when all of that is gone and there is nothing left, I remember just being at the end of my road and wondering mm -hmm. how I had gotten there. <laughs> um, prisons, jails, probation, parole, all that came with that, it took all of that for me to finally get the understanding of knowing that I was just totally powerless over my life and how things had become. Yes, step one. Um, step one um, is the easiest step in recovery and it's also the hardest step. For me, um, it was... Uh, the reason it was difficult is I had to admit that, uh, that my life was out of order and I was out of control. Uh, once I was able to do that, then it became easy that uh, I knew that I needed help. I know when I'd, I'd reached the end of myself, and I, I remember the night very clearly, I was sitting in a bar, and uh, I said to myself, you know, that I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And there's got to be more to life than this. And I didn't realize it at the time, that that was actually a prayer to God. Mm -hmm. And when I, when I had said that, it was rather strange how God works through others. There was a, a friend of mine who was drunker than I was uh, when I told him this. And uh, he said, well, you know, I'm not ready for recovery, but I do have some friends that are, and maybe you need to talk to them. Mm -hmm. And the next thing I know that I'm, I'm on the phone with somebody and the next evening I, uh, I went to my first recovery meeting and I started the process. And um, it, um, it was bumpy at first, but the reality that um, it was hard for me to admit that uh, my life was unmanageable. I had no problem admitting that for me being an alcoholic that I had a problem with alcohol. But um, it was difficult to come to the end of myself that everything else in my life was unmanageable too. And I had to start, uh, as all of you will have, uh, the first thing is to deal with the addiction. And then God will work with you to, uh, to deal with the unmanageability. Uh, I've been in recovery for 23 years, and I have to admit I've not arrived yet. Mm. But my life is, uh, I, I tend to feel a, a lot better today than it was when I, was, when I first started. Yeah. But the hardest part is the beginning, taking the first step. And then, but once you take that first step, you're taking a step, you have motion, and you're moving towards the Lord, and He will do the rest. All He's looking for is you to get a little momentum, and he will push you through. You know, step one is uh, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable. Um, you know, for me, it was a little bit more than alcohol. It was um, powerless over my addiction. Um, you know, when I got sober in 1977, I, uh, I had been drinking heavily and I uh, was also using IV heroin for a number of years. And when I was 24 years old, the drug had really taken me down to a point where I'd gone from, uh, you know, a middle-class uh, Chicago, nice ethnic family to living in the streets and living in the ghetto and in and out of jail and a very long arrest record, etc. I mean, not unlike many heroin addicts, um, I fit the stereotype of a street junkie. And... Um, I was arrested when I was 24 years old and charged with felonies, and uh, uh, there was an intervention that took place that ha I didn't have very much to do with. 
but I was given an opportunity to go to a rehab center instead of prison. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was, I was a heroin addict, but I wasn't stupid. So, <laughs> you know, I, I opted for a rehab. The rehab center was 16 months. And uh, during that time, I was exposed to the 12-step fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And at that time, we didn't have Narcotics Anonymous in this area. Uh, but through that, I kind of, I grasped hold of something that was really important to me, and it was the spiritual, the spirituality behind the steps, kind of the underpinnings of the steps. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, I understood the first step. I was powerless. I didn't think, I, you know, I thought that was kind of a no-brainer, you know, so I never really paid too close of attention to the first step. Um, and, you know, I went along my way and, you know, went to meetings and had a sponsor and, you know, I did well in recovery. I got myself in college and, you know, earned a master's degree and, you know, started practicing uh, in this profession uh, early back in 1980, actually. Um, but the one thing that was, it seemed to be missing and I didn't know it at the time was kind of centered around the first step, you know. Uh, and they always say that that's the one step that you have to work perfectly. You know, you really need to get that. And for some reason, I don't think I really got that. Um, and as I continued along in my practice and, you know, all the blessings of recovery, everything that God bestowed upon me, uh, I mismanaged, you know. Uh, for some reason, I was not able to handle the success, handle the money, you know, the, you know, there was a certain amount of prestige with the kind of work I did, and, you know, I had some opportunities that were given to me to work with, you know, professional athletes and really high-profile kind of work up in Carolina. Um, and I lost probably the most important part of my recovery at that time, and that was my sense of humility. Um, mm. You know, I, I, I went from being so grateful to have come from being a heroin addict living in the ghetto with a criminal record to being a, a respected professional with a home and friends and, you know, a wardrobe and things like that. Instead of gratitude for that, I soon came to believe that I really was the one who had something to do with all those things <laughs> happening. You know? Yes. And, and as things came my way, I wondered why there wasn't more. And, you know, if I had X amount of dollars in the bank, I thought, well, you know, other people have more, and that should be me. Um, you know, and I kind of lost the focus of the spiritual components to this step or what the, or what the, the program is all about. And, uh, you know, with powerlessness, that was what I didn't get, you know. I never really fully understood, even though I was a, a chemical dependency professional and respected in the field, I had a doctorate by this time in, in psychology, I practiced addiction psychology, I've worked with thousands of people who were addicts and a lot of them got into recovery. Um, I didn't know what this disease was, I, mean, I thought I did, but I really never knew what it was that I had, I didn't know what addiction was. I thought really it was just about not using the drugs and never re really realized that addiction is really a brain disorder that <clears throat> left to its own devices, my brain will eventually convince me that using drugs is a good idea. Mm -hmm. I didn't see it happening. It, it was you know, slowly over a long period of time the erosion of my recovery took place you know probably five years before I actually got myself in trouble again but by 1998 which is a little bit over 20 years in recovery I was angry I was depressed I was anxious I was working an enormous amount of hours I didn't go to meetings I didn't really think that anybody could tell me anything anymore that would be helpful to me I no longer talk to anybody about my own issues you know and the only person at that time guiding me in recovery was me hmm. and the real scary part about that was I wasn't that healthy anymore you know so I really had you know I really had a fool for a sponsor and uh, in 1998, it seemed like a good idea for me to use drugs, and I did. And uh, that set off a relapse that took me, you know, about three years <laughs> to get back into recovery. This time, as I look at the first step, 
you know, that's something I look at every day, you know, what it is that I'm here for today to take care of my addiction. And, um, you know, I think, I think hopefully I have a better handle on that today. Step one for me was a critical step because I'd been around the rooms of uh, recovery for a number of years and never could seem to uh, make any real progress. And I might do well for a little while and then I'd go back to my old behaviors. Uh, I always thought that I had done step one correctly, but I'd never really done it correctly. And what I found out this time around was God opened my eyes to see that uh, in the recovery literature it says that there's one who has all power, that one is God, may you find him now. And I saw at that point when I heard that, is the fact that if God has all power, how much power does that leave me? <laughs> and that leaves me no power. Amen. And so I, I had really never seen that before. And what I had always held on to in the past was I thought I had the power of choice over that first drug or drink. And as long as I maintained that power, uh, I was doomed. And I would always go back out and do what I did before. And I completely uh, surrendered that power at that point and said, okay, Lord, I don't have any power over this thing. I don't have the power of choice e e uh, even. And unless you do this for me, it's not gonna occur. And so uh, I approached powerlessness in that fashion and, and uh, came to find out later on by reading more recovery literature that uh, other people had come to that conclusion before I did. And uh, so it was nothing novel or unique. It was just something that uh, had been a, an existing truth all along. The unmanageability part of stuff, when I never really had a problem with, I was at the point of uh, uh, no return. There was really nothing left to lose for me and I saw that my plan hadn't worked, wasn't working now, and was never going to work. Amen. And uh, by realizing that, I, I uh, saw my life was unmanageable. So that, that wasn't a big deal for me. Uh, the only other thing that, that uh, really helped me with step one to get through it and helped me see all this was the fact that I had a, a, a friend of mine and we challenged each other to come up with some examples of powerlessness and unmanageability and we put those things on paper and then we shared those together with each other and as we did that uh, there was a sort of healing that began to take place I will say this when I got done with my step one uh, I realized that there was no human power in this world that was going to relieve me of my alcoholism or addiction and that was pretty disconcerting that was kind of scary because uh, if there was no human power that was going to do this, I was in pretty bad shape. And if there had not been more steps to follow, I probably would have just taken a gun out and ended it right there because uh, <laughs> I didn't have a very, a very uh, rosy future ahead of me. It, it looked pretty bleak when I got done with step one, but thank God there was, there was more to come.